Lorenzo, it's so nice to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, absolutely. No, you do very interesting work um, combining together, you know, neurodiversity. I loved your TED Talk um, on uh, the Nash Equilibrium's game theory. That's all quite fascinating. How does that all fit together in your thinking? Um, gosh, such a good question. Um, we only start with big macro big, questions. Big, 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 big <laughs> macro questions. Um, basically, the insight, the insight I came across in my research in grad school was that uh, there is a way in which cognitive biases can be overcome by people, but when they get together. Not automatically just by getting them together, but specifically when they work together and share information effectively, mm. they're able to achieve insights that escape even the experts. Hmm. It, because all of this started because, you know, I was very into Daniel Kahneman's research on thinking fast and slow, Think about cognitive slow, biases, right, right. and uh, a lot of research in cognitive science is very much about that. It's about how do you overcome cognitive biases? Hmm. And I found that actually the best counter-argument against the view of the human brain is just like a, just through its flaws hmm. is by looking at the potential when brains kind of get together. Hmm. So initially, we used to think you know, of collective intelligence, which is the technical term for this, hmm. through the lenses of like the experiments like guessing the number of jelly beans in a jar and taking the average. So right, you guess, right. guess a class of students to guess the number of jelly beans in the jar and taking hmm. the average. You have to get to within a few percentage points of the answer. Hmm. Um, we, and scientists for a long time thought, this is just randomness, if you just take a random sample right, of 30. Right. The truth turns out to be a little bit more complicated. And mm. it turns out that uh, uh, proportional to the diversity of the people involved, when you get a bunch of people together, they are able to get to insights that escape the experts. Oh, interesting. So if you had like a collective of people that are all the same, speaking generally, that would not be as accurate if you have a diverse group. Exactly, because it would be self-reinforcing. So, ah. And that's why the kind of diversity that really be becomes the marker of collective intelligence. Interesting. It's, it's not... Um, Social diversity, it's viewpoint diversity. Because I was about diversity. to ask, you know, when you say diversity, you know, there's lots of different types of diversity. There's religious diversity, ethnic diversity, you know, occupational diversity and different things like that. But you found that the real, uh, the benefits really come when there's a focus on neurodiversity. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Like, so, and again, collective knowledge just functions at all, all these different levels. It simultaneously explains as to why um, uh, people with very different musical tastes can come mm. together and play the best orchest orchestral scores. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. All the way to, yeah, like this this idea of if, if diversity is the single biggest predictor of collective intelligence, i.e. the ability for groups of people to overcome, you know, ex to, to get to points that are better than expertise, mm. um, then you would start looking at cognitive diversity, like the ability to see the world differently. Uh, and obviously yeah. we're used to thinking in terms of uh, personality diversity, yeah, like yeah, extroverts yeah. and introverts. If yeah. you have just a room full of extroverts, you are going to be have some biases that get mm. reinforced. Mm. Um, mm. If you have a room full of introverts, you're going to have some biases that get reinforced. Mm. And only mm. when you have the two of them do they average each other out, right, and so you right. get to an even better answer. Interesting. Um, the way neurodiversity kind of plays into this is uh, I started kind of very much looking into what are some of the most extreme cases of cognitive diversity, like this notion where like if human perception is heavily mediated by neurobiology and like mm. those kinds of differences, right? Mm. Uh, who are the kinds of people that really perceive the world radically differently than the kind of people that like we would usually be interacting mm. with? Mm. Um, the first kind of example that came to mind because I have friends who are on the autism spectrum is are people with, with autism. Mm. Um, and the, as I started delving more into the research about autism, I learned that uh, the, the current explanation as to what makes people on the autism spectrum different from neurotypical people is that their mirror neuron system that basically normally leads humans to imitate each other um, is different from that of neurotypical people. And, and usually this is a bug. Right? We, we're used to seeing it in the context of kids having a hard time picking up language because we pick up language through imitation. Mm. Uh, and, uh, but actually it can be a feature. The example I always give is Michael Burry, the guy from The Big Short. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like he made over a billion dollars in the middle of the financial crisis uh, doing a very contrarian bet you know, by betting against Morgan. Yeah, 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 Everybody yeah, yeah. thought that he was crazy. And uh, years later, he found out he was on the autism spectrum, and he realized that part of his way was so comfortable uh, walking into meetings with people thinking that he was crazy. You know, was precisely because <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, people with autism just uh, are less susceptible to peer pressure. Well, that's, that, that's very interesting because usually autism, you know, I did sign language for a long time and there's this kind of idea that the deaf community doesn't like being called handicapped because they feel yes, it as sort of yes, a cultural yes. identity. And, you totally. know, so this idea, so it's a real controversy on cochlear implants and, and different things like that. And so it's interesting to think because usually when we hear autism, there's an idea that there's a sort of less than, there's a sort yes. of um, inability to operate or something like that. But what you are suggesting um, is that autism as a form of neurodiversity might be able to increase the efficiency of collective intelligence and to help us um, arrive at 
solutions to problems that if we were just, just using, dare I call, uh, normal or classical rationality, <laughs> neurotypical we, people. Neuro yeah, yeah, neurotypical, that's, that's the way we would not people. arrive at. Yeah, like, because I think, there's this way, I can stress the, the term, is because I think the people in the, uh, the autism community is actually navigated this territory effectively, because they, from their framework, there's the typical human sure. expression. So normal there, has a kind of weighted. Exactly, exactly. Like, yeah, uh, sure. So sure. there's typical human expression, there's our virgin human expression, mm. and uh, especially because autism is thought of as a spectrum. Right, mm, so you can mm, be, mm. you know, uh, and so and once you start thinking in terms of like what else, it, what other aspects of humanity are expressed through a typical form, where the divergences can actually be value adds. Mm. And so the, the other kind of example I can start looking into is uh, people, uh, transgender people are less susceptible to optical illusions. Wow. We don't understand why, huh? Um, but it, it shows that we barely scratch the surface. You were just talking about like the example of like kind of always framing neurodivergence in terms of disability. Right. I think the transgender community experiences this all, all, all the time, right? Interesting. Like, um, and the, the, the Michael Burry equivalent, I think, of transgender people um, is uh, Martine Rothblatt, the, oh, the founder CEO. of SiriusXM, yeah, 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 yeah. and she, she also runs United Therapeutics, a biotech firm. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, like, I mean, she, she's the highest paid female CEO in pharma. Wow. She's curing a bunch of rare diseases. She pioneers wow. many different business models. Um, but most people don't know about her, right? Yeah. I mean, many ways she's like kind sure, of a very sure. private person, but it kind of shows you like, I think if people even just knew that what the highest paid female CEO in yeah. the world is transgender, like they would stop thinking of transgender people as just people who are suffering and, you know, need to be mm -hmm. supported, even mm -hmm. though that's very important. Um, and instead we start to be thinking, wow, so without Martine Rothblatt, we probably would not have uh, Howard Stern, mm -hmm. the serious XM, right? It would not mm -hmm. exist. Uh, and we probably would not have a bunch of these diseases being cured. Mm -hmm. So what else... Are we not in, be able to tap into it because of society, um, because we are either directly or indirectly kind of excluding different minds? Basically. Mm. Well, it's interesting to think. I mean, you seem to be emphasizing neurodiversity and its pot potential to be a value add process. You know, where it's not simply like a stagnant, perhaps um, acknowledgement of identity, but you're like making really a strong positive case that um, particular neurodiversity, such as on the spectrum or transsexuality. Uh, can can lead to pr solutions to problems that you will not arrive at uh, if you're just using tip typical thought uh, to use that language and and so that would get into game theory if if I'm not mistaken yes 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 so the the way kind of game theory kind of fits into this is this notion that you know game theory studies the endpoints of rational decision making hmm. so what are, what, are, what are the outcomes that are predicted by uh, rational players interacting with each other under different strategic circumstances under hmm. different incentives. Hmm. And uh, one of the big takeaways from game theory is whether you're looking at the prisoner's dilemma, uh, segregation games, and all these different ways, is that uh, rational behavior can get you stuck. Mm. Uh, can get you stuck in suboptimal situations. If you look at the prisoner's dilemma, uh, that you can be stuck in a situation where even though the mutually beneficial outcome is to cooperate, mm. uh, the rational thing to do is to actually betray each other because your expectation right. is the other person will betray you. And the way this plays out with nuclear weapons, uh, the way this plays out in, in business and marketing, all these mm -hmm. things, like, um, game theory just, it, it, precisely because game theory applies to so many aspects, whether it's a, a biological evolution or mm -hmm. uh, business decision mm -hmm. making, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it shows that this, this problem of, uh, you know, it, encountering a rational impasse, as mm -hmm. you like to put it, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, being stuck in the suboptimal Nash equilibrium uh, is something where if you found a solution, uh, it would be extremely important, uh, especially to avoid self-destruction in the case of like the prisoner's dilemma right. and nuclear weapons. And so um, I always go back to this theme of like, if the game theory studies decision making and it's showing you that rational decision making leads to a suboptimal scenario, mm -hmm. then like whatever gets you out of that suboptimal scenario is not, it, it, it's not rational because the rational thing is to be in that scenario. Um, it's not quite irrational because it's not against your self-interest. Right. So you would have to be non-rational. Non that's that's right. the way I kind of frame this. And yeah. so, and so again, it goes back to a non-rational mechanism to overcome a rational impasse mm -hmm. brings benefits to everybody, right? On the opposite. Um, but it would have to be something that uh, very easily gets perceived as irrational, is a deviation from rationality, even though if you approached it you know, analytically enough, like it wouldn't be irrational. And I think that's where neurodivergence kind of comes in. Like mm. when we think of people on the autism spectrum, the, in their ability to see the world differently, to overcome peer pressure in ways that we can't, uh, 
it's not irrational because we all know that peer pressure right. is bad a lot of times, right? right? Um, it's not rational though because 99% of the time uh, you want to be able to right. navigate social circumstances like right. you know by imitation. Um, so it's non-rational. Oh yeah, and I think that's an example where the project of Derrida to break down binaries and dichotomies is quite useful because when you're existing in a world where there's rational or irrational, then if you're not being rational, you're being irrational, and that's bad. And so you, to break that down and talk about irrational or non-rational, I think is extremely important. And if you don't have the category for non-rational, that then, then that's going to really get in the way. Well, that's going to have practical impacts. This is an idea where ideas have practical impacts. You're, even everything you're describing couldn't even occur to you if you're stuck within the uh, sort of this binary, I suppose, of a rational and irrational. And then the other thing you're saying, it might, you know, Marcuse once uh, in an interview said something along the lines of he said, um, if you're trying to get home as quickly as possible, it's rational at five, at the moment the clock hits five o'clock at work to run down and get in your car and, uh, you know, drive home as quick as you can. But when everyone does that at the same time, you get in a traffic jam. Th that's funny because game theory studies traffic. Traffic is one of the oh, yeah? best arguments. Yeah, yeah, because... Um, there are a lot of circumstances called braces paradox, where mm. removing a shortcut can actually improve traffic. Because oh, that's it, hilarious. Yeah, because it, the existence of the shortcut makes everybody take it, so traffic gets worse. So if you remove it, then 50% uh, of the people go for one route and the other 50% go for the other route. Oh, that's very interesting. So adding a shortcut can make things worse and removing one can make things better. Well, that's, uh, well, that's all quite fascinating because if you're just thinking in terms of rational, oh, well, make a shortcut. That'll make it better. But when you do that, all of the patterns get screwed it, up. And exactly. It doesn't work. Because there are all these unintended consequences, <laughs> right? Which is why, mm -hmm. you know, like the, 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 there's uh, one of the big takeaways from game theory is that you kind of want to decentralize things. But the, to me, I think like the point that I always kind of go back to is this notion of uh, if somebody stands up and says, actually, guys, like if we were implementing a shortcut in our town, it would make traffic worse. They would be labeled insane. Right. And, and this right, is where we get into right. the whole Foucault conversation about uh, Epstein. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the people, ironically, the people that cannot conform to social norms mm. uh, are precisely the kinds of people that can see the world in ways that uh, we need to be able to perceive. To so, that, see so if someone in a, town, st um, in a town hall meeting stands up and they have a solution that will actually optimize the game, per se, because there is a lack of the category of, one, there's a lack of knowledge about game theory, so it's not even aware that you can have a, a suboptimal result when everyone is rational, then people don't even have the paradigm by which to understand what they're saying other than in terms of being crazy. And so, you know, again, that's a practical way, but, you know, I'm always big on this idea that we, um, we make this split between practical people and idea people. And I think that's so problematic because your understanding of what is practical is relative to the ideas through which you define practical. And so by not even having the idea of the non-rational or not even have the idea of neurodiversity um, waking you up, being the way that you realize that the collective sum of rational actors is going to give rise to a suboptimal result, well, well, then you don't. Then, you, then it would actually make sense to call that person crazy yeah. because you lack the framework in which you can think of them as offering a solution. Well, I guess you, you know, Shakespeare's fool, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. The fool is the only character that gets to tell the truth, right? Yes. Uh, and, uh, and in some ways, you know, Foucault actually kind of remarks about that. It says, like, you know, if you look at the Middle Ages, uh, mentally ill people were considered like a manifestation of the voice of God. Yeah, sure. And we have actually moved away from that. We we have created asylums, right? Because oh, we sure. start thinking about it as it's an aberrance. It's a it's a flaw, you know, and, and in many ways mentally ill people like threaten society. Mm. But if you start thinking of mental illness as like a spectrum of divergence, mm -hmm. sure, there there are totally forms of mental illnesses that can be dangerous. Of course. Uh, you know, threatening to other people. Sure. Um, but some of the most brilliant people in history mm -hmm. and some of the or some of the most valuable voices that we should be having in our conversations, mm -hmm. right? Um, maybe coming from it, I always think of like the line from, um, what is it, Our Town, like the only people that realize the value of life are saints and poets, <laughs> right? Um, because poets are depressed, mm, <laughs> right? Like, funny. you know, is this notion of like, yeah, yeah, and, and like, it would be perfectly rational, right, to remove the pressure from the population through genetic engineering, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and yet, what if mm -hmm. we lose all poetry? Because only somebody who cannot fit into life can mm -hmm. no longer sleepwalk through it to notice the beauty within every moment. Well, and that almost gets into the problem of which, um, I guess, in Aristotle, uh, rationality is always a means because the ends must be pre-assumed by which to define the rationality. And so it's not, you're not able to assume a rational course of action without, well, to, uh, to implement a rational course without assuming the ends of what it looks like to be rational. But of course, that's a problem. And if you because can't see it, yes, right? Yes. Because that's, this is the notion I think that people have a hard time hearing out sometimes, like the rationality can actually blind you. Yes. As opposed to, because... For most cases, rationality uh, enlightens you, yes. right? You move away from you know, your own bias and superstition. But then I always think of 
the term groupthink mm-hmm. was created to describe experts in yes. situations like the Bay of Pigs invasion, yes. where if they all have the same background, they're looking at the same information, yes. right, and have the same kind of like schema yes. and, and theoretical framework, like they end up becoming overconfident in just the wrong direction. Yes, and that's what we think of groupthink. The antidote to groupthink is viewpoint diversity. Absolutely. And, and yet, what will be the reaction if only one member of the tribe, you know, goes against what the tribe, you know, uh, you know well, goes well, almost against. by definition, whoever is diverging from the consensus is going to be a minority. Because if it wasn't, then it would be the majority. So the only real hope is um, because it's kind of natural to assume the person speaking different is wrong because the consensus against them is to have a framework that you are proposing in which there is space to think of the individual as offering a, a um, divergent viewpoint that is offering an insight that you cannot arrive at through the, the rational consensus. And so what you're offering is a framework to help with decision making that if you don't have the framework, it, it just, again, it's just kind of rational to disregard that individual. Yeah. It, it, and, and the thing is, like, we, it could be also, it, in, I think in many ways we have this learned helplessness where we mm-hmm. just embrace, like, oh, like, you know, eventually we just make mistakes, uh, things in organizations collapse, you know, whatever. Right. Like, as opposed to thinking, no, maybe, the, no, maybe an organization, a country, or a family collapses when the consensus is 99 to 1. Yeah. When it, oh, yeah. You know, Teal has this great line, you know, like, uh, you know, if it's, uh, you know, 50, 51 to 49, mm-hmm. you know, you can assume mm-hmm. the majority is right. Mm-hmm. If it's 70, 30, mm-hmm. they're even more mm-hmm. right. But mm-hmm. it, if it's 99 to 1, you're in North Korea. Right. Um, no, but think about it. The 1% that would stand up against the 99%, that's mm-hmm. so irrational. The risk of you, yes. nobody would actually in the right mind think that ah, they're I confident see. enough, yes. right? That, yes, yes. And uh, this is where we get into another game theory. It almost requires a certain uh, neurodiversity. Exactly, to exactly. Yes. And, and like the way in which I think like, you know, Foucault's view of madness and neurodivergence like comes together with a game theory is this notion of the way game theorists think of strikes. Mm. You know, a situation where if everybody changes their behavior, mm. everybody improves, in, but ex- except uh, if you end up in the minority, not enough people do this, right? Mm. Uh, all the risk, all the uh, punishment on is on you, right? Um, is that only a non-rational individual mm. would be, uh, would engage in a strike, even though it just takes, I think, tipping points which is the, the term that's used to describe um, when, uh, you know, like basically you have an exponential curve going on, mm-hmm. so like social change or something, mm-hmm. like a situation, mm-hmm. is around like 20%. So if you mm-hmm. look at like segregated neighborhoods, it only takes about 20% of the households uh, of the neighbors to be racially integrated for the entire neighborhood to become racially integrated. Oh, interesting. Uh, huh. It's a similar thing for schools. Hmm. So what that means is that basically because the other 80% is just going to copy mm. what everybody else is doing, ah. once you reach 20% of the population moving from one behavior to the next, mm. everybody starts to change their behavior. But to get to that, you need the one. And it's, exactly. almost, and it's <laughs> almost like you seem, you seem to be suggesting that the existential, cognitive, whatever, psychological, social burden is so great on uh, to be that one that it's just basic probability theory that the only people that are going to do it are going to be ones that are neurally diverse. Well, exactly, because they have no choice but to. To be that way. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. Because I was always thinking about like, you know, uh, if courage is in short supply, then genius, right? This mm. notion of like being willing to take a stand. Because like the history of mm. science, there's a lot mm. of moments where a scientist uses rationality and the scientific method mm-hmm. to discover something that they become more confident on, mm. you know, to stand up. Like, medicine is yeah, an example. Yeah, sure, right? sure. Like superstition. But I think like, that's less of what this scenario, like we should not be trying to construct a society or bet on the health of our society by betting that those people will always be there. People with enough courage to go up against the 99%. Uh, Instead, we should be thinking like, who are the people that just like by existing? They have no choice but to, you know, disrupt our current way of thinking. Likely. Oh, that's, yeah. that's quite interesting. No. Um, well, because it, it, it almost seems to be that you're suggesting that if the lessons of game theory are to be practically implemented, it is only a matter of probability that it will be the neuro, the neurodiverse um, of whom will implement those those lessons, and therefore we can learn all the game theory we want, we can get all the models we want, but those models will not actually be practiced unless the neurally diverse are integrated into our systems. Is that a fair it, summary? It, exactly, exactly. And I think like with that, require in many ways, I think it's like such a powerful message for the neurodiverse. Oh, right? and I was about you know? to say one of the things I really like about it 
is, I think it's Conyers, he has this uh, book, The Long Truth, where he talks about the difference between tolerance and humility. And he talks about, like, for example, you know, no one really likes to be tolerated. Like, I just like, uh, Lorenzo, I, I tolerate you. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, well, that's nice. Okay, well, you're not killing me, but mm, I don't really feel. But if I say, you know, oh, Lorenzo, I really like listening to you. You really have something to add. And there's something, like, it's humility, because I'm implying that you can give me something I cannot give myself, that there's a real value add. So when you're saying to someone who's on the spectrum, you say, oh, well, you know, they're different, so we'll let them be here and tolerate them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, as opposed to going, no, there, there's, there's something that, the only way we're going to get through NAS equilibriums, the only exactly. way we're going to break rational impasses, where uh, rationality, you know, and to describe the rational impasse, I, I just, the, the image that comes to mind is the, uh, that Three Stooges um, part in The Simpsons, you know, the source of all education, is uh, where, you know, they're describing Homer Simpson and he's saying, well, the reason you're not sick, even though you have like more viruses in your body than everyone is, because they're trying to rush into your body and they all get stuck in the doorway yeah, right. at the same time. <laughs> so the Stooges so they're all about So there's a sense in which what rational rationality um, does is everyone is being rational so everyone runs to the door to get out of the room because there's a fire or something and they all get stuck yes. where the ira you almost need that non-rational person who steps back and says well let me just wait five seconds even though there's a fire right there so we all don't all get stuck in the door and all die um and so so to say to get back to the point so to, to, to think is like oh man no like we really need the the um the the person on the spectrum part of our system because we have something to learn from them. They're the only way we're not going to end up um, in, in a rational impasse, all getting stuck in the door. That's such an affirmative message. Exactly. Uh, for, for both sides, right? Because like, yes. it, it gives hope to yeah. the marginalized, in many ways. Mm. Uh, but then it requires all of us to no longer be passive. Because then, mm. they, if, cause if we're looking for ways to improve the world, mm. it's no longer about optimization to rationality. It's rather mm. about inclusion of the neurodivergent. Mm. And so the that's why, you know, like... It, Part of one of the implications of this collective intelligence view is that you should always constantly be asking whether you're an organization, a country, or whatever, right? Uh, whose voice is not being included? Mm. Uh, and in, in, in not just like something, somebody who's marginally different. Again, like sure. it's something that like the more uncomfortable, the more disruptive mm. the voice would be, mm. uh, the more value they would bring because again, they would shake up the system. To mm. force us to reconsider things that we take for granted. Is it is it almost where rationality? You know, we talk about the lose and kind of the losing capture. You know, where uh, institutions are captured by capital or, or whatever. Um, is it almost where the problem is that rationality? We really underestimate how much um, typical rationality is captured by social pressures. Do you think that's one? That, like we really <sighs> fail to estimate how, the, how the, much. The, okay, that's so interesting because, like, on some level, like the. The takeaway from the Enlightenment was that rationality can break you out of yeah, yeah, social, yeah, social yeah. pressure, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. It, it's so because also if you go to a rationalist meetup, they're all talking about cognitive biases. And yeah, like yeah, not yeah. trust yourself. Like I think it's like again, it goes one step further. It's it's this it's this notion of like the problem when you're stuck in a rational impasse is not that you're being too rational. It's not that being mm -hmm. less rational mm -hmm. takes you out of it. It, it, it's it's more that uh, the only way out of it is either stop playing the game altogether mm -hmm. or like entirely redirecting our efforts to like redrawing the board. Mm -hmm. uh, th this way, I think of traffic as the example. It's not that if you drive more quickly or drive more slowly mm -hmm. or hyper schedule people, mm -hmm. trap you you stop you, you solve traffic as a problem. Mm -hmm. It requires uh, redrawing the highway system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, like you know, um, and but but the, th and the thing the, the thing is though, most ways in which you would redraw the highway system would probably make traffic worse. Right, right, and, and this is why, like, for in most circumstances, like we tend to stick with what's sort of working, mm -hmm. right? Because most alternatives to it uh, would be worse. Right, uh, and yet, and yet, uh, you know, like if the right entity, the right perception, right, would be able to identify the way to reconfigure things to kind of make them better. Right, uh, the what will be required, and maybe this is actually something actually I'm not, you and I have not talked about this before, but like, you know, that comes up more now in some of the conversations I've been having, which is that you almost need also like a new type of person mm. who, can, who can bridge the gap between the neurodiverse person mm. and the masses. Mm. Because again, it's not just the initial person going on strike. Mm. You need the other 19% of people mm. to reach the tipping point. Mm. Mm. And that's a different personality. Be, right, because they're, oh, yeah, they're not the yeah. first mover; they're almost like an the early adopter. Yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. It, isn't there that whole thing with the crew? It talks about like the first mover. The the big question is if they get the first follower, and then exactly. everyone kind of pours we, in. And you see, so that's one of the takeaways. Like if you think about these days, it's like if you're neurotypical, it's not just about uh, 
you know, don't be mean to the mark. No, don't marginalize yeah, people sure. or ask yourself in the ways in which you're marginalized people. It's almost like, no, like the most productive thing you can do is, uh, becoming the kind of person that can effectively identify, mm. uh, you know, the right voice to follow because the first follower, mm -hmm. right. Uh, mm -hmm. to kind of bring about social change through these tipping points. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, in that requires, again, almost like a different type of personality, like somebody who understands social pressure enough that they wouldn't be the first one doing that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, honestly, the neurodiverse people, like, they don't understand the value of what they're saying themselves. Sure. Right? And, I, and I think, though, that gets into why it's so, why I like what you're describing, because it moves from tolerance to humility. Because if I, because it's like, I tolerate you, therefore I'll follow you. Like, you know, but if, I, exactly, exactly, if I'm yeah. humble, then I, there's a following that is inherently integrated into that. And so right now, you know, there's a lot of doctrine of tolerance, which of course, that's not bad. I mean, of course you want to tolerate minorities in a sense, but you don't want to only tolerate minorities because then you're not following my, you don't, it's not like you think you, it's not like in that schema, you think that it, it at least it sounds like it, you know. Um, that you think that if you follow the minority, you will gain something or that they have something to show you. But humility suggests a leadership follow role where if I'm being humble, I believe that you can lead me somewhere. So I really think I'm bringing back that doctrine of humility yes. kind of has integrated a, um, uh, a relationship between a first mover and a first follower where intolerance, is, it's not there at all. Well, it, it, it's so antithetical to a rationalist framework where mm. uh, it would be a hierarchical. Mm. Right, right, right. It would be right, the opposite. Right. It's, like, it's like we're creating this Babel Tower, right? right? Where right. Uh, we use knowledge accumulated through rationality, right, mm -hmm. to evaluate who to follow, right? right? Oh, yeah. As opposed to like, no, it's the opposite. It's like the the person whose lived experience, perception, whatever you that's want to right. call it, like, is cannot be categorized through our current systems of knowledge. That's the person we need to be studying. Well, and, right? of course, and the problem is, of course, also is that tolerance would not defeat a, a hierarchy. You would tolerate the hierarchy. Exactly. Um, and that, I guess, yeah. is the point for Marcuse, too, with the professor Tom. But humility is anti-hierarchical. It, what's interesting is humility is not necessarily anti-order, but it would be anti-hierarchy, -hi which then you would have to get into and, all and, that. And, you know, there is a, uh, such a great parallel in like, the tech industry. In mm. terms of, like, it's called the universe dilemma. This notion of like, uh, you know, why are free mm. corporations bad at innovation? Uh, and kind of the the outcome is that yeah because of the corporate politics and the incentive structures mm. uh, corporations are better off basically buying startups. Oh, Be, it, it, it always thought like yeah because like in a way this is not just a one shot game. Uh, yeah, the best way to consistently be innovative, like even if you are a genius yourself, right? I, I always think of like great novels like. At most, it's Alessio Dostoevsky, right? Like yes. you write one great novel, <laughs> right? You know, um, right. that's the. Um, but if you wanted to output a lot, like if you wanted to achieve greatness more than once, mm. uh, you can't rely on your own inspiration. Mm. You have to be going to very, very challenging places that make you uh, reconsider a lot of your assumptions. Oh, yeah. Uh, right? Because that's the most valuable type of... Like, I think a lot of times greatness is associated with uh, tapping into something that previously was not even part of the equation. Mm. Right? Mm. Uh, and so... In, in the tech industry, like this is very much about the parallels. Like, how do how do you retain a competitive edge as a successful tech company mm. once you have had your own innovation that took you to that stage? Mm. Uh, you have to literally start going to the startup world where yeah. ninety percent of them fail because they're bad ideas, right? right? To pick out the ten percent, mm. so that you and you have to do this consistently, right? To then incorporate potential. And this is what happens a lot in the tech mm. industry, where like the startup gets acquired. And if often, often it's a startup whose product was not succeeding that much, but as part of the larger company's hmm. frame, like, you know, infrastructure, uh, that startup's idea becomes like the biggest feature. Hmm. You know, hmm. in the well, what's interesting company. is there's something about that that's almost like someone going out and seeking neuro, uh, neurodiversity, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's, what's, that's why it's the parallel, that, like, even, because, like, when we're talking about, like, seeking out neurodiversity, unfortunately, this has not happened a lot in history, right? Yeah. Like, but when you think about the tech industry, like, this is the consensus now. That the only way you can sustain a tech company for a decade or more right. uh, is not by trying to innovate internally. Mm. It's by trying to go outside and effectively identifying, right? Like, well, and I think that gets into the specter of the um, the specter of autonomous reasoning that we talk about with deconstructing common life and David Hume. And see, for a very long time, we've had this idea that if we just are rational and we're irrational very well, kind of like what you were saying, well, then that's going to solve all our problems. So the idea 
you don't want diversity. <laughs> you know, you just want to be more rational. And anything that's different from what is considered rational is a threat. And that gets into whole Conrad Adorno and the dialectic. Well, thing where especially because rationality is not very good at reconciling difference anyway. No, it's totalizing. By definition, yeah, it's yeah, totalizing. Yeah, exactly, it's about exactly. ironing out difference. I mean, rationality almost wants to break everything down to a, a single dimension. Almost, yes, you know, yes, like yes. just make it, make everything A is A. You know, once you start saying that identities are composed of multiple A's and multiple like moving parts, it's like, nah, let's just call it a single A and make it fit to that. So, I mean, what they like Horkheimer and uh, Adorno warned is that the totalitarian movements of the 20th century were necessarily children of the Enlightenment because the Enlightenment wants to make everything rational. So it's as if what's starting to happen today, and maybe starting in the tech world and it's spreading everywhere, is a realization that uh, the dream of autonomous rationality is um, the is the ultimate result of that is a suboptimal society. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and it can be look great in the short run. Yes. Because it's hyper-optimized. Yes. Uh, so it would be better than something that's not optimized for yes. Right? Uh, but in the long run, it stagnates. That's correct. We, we, but I also at this, like, one of the things I feel like I end up disagreeing with Adorno on, for example, mm. uh, like he thought that uh, the inherent consequence of a consumer society is this uh, homogenization, this yeah, commoditization yeah. of culture, perception, right. humanity. Right? What I think he underestimated is that no, actually, it would like the, instead of everybody listening to the same music, watching the same movies, right? It ends up being that like the more inclusive the consumer society, yeah. um, the more like you know, crazy preferences you know find early adopters that then become mainstream ideas, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that actually enriches the human experience, right? Because right. all of a sudden, and I think about like to, you know through the internet today, like, you know, uh, you know, American teenage girls end up obsessing over Korean pop bands. Oh, right. Right. You, you know, sure. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, or like in all these unexpected ways, like rap music mm -hmm. succeeds mm -hmm. massively, mm -hmm. you know, in Asia, mm -hmm. right. Like, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, these other, mm -hmm. you know, these other ways. Like, so I think that's why, cause he always thought like, yeah, like the, this hyper optimizing capitalist drive mm -hmm. drives everything to become like a Walmart, McDonald's, like hyper standardized thing. Sure. And instead, that's part of it. I think what, what he discounted is the fact that like Walmart, and McDonald's have increased access a ton, right? So, oh, sure. but like once people's living conditions improve, they they start to seek out variety and novelty. And novelty and variety are best discovered on a consistent basis mm -hmm. uh, by looking at what, what it's called the in business it's called the tail products. You know, yeah, and, I, and I think in, you know, I mean this could get into the problem with Adorno is that. Um, is that there is a uh, mono, it's almost like technology is all blurred into the same, but information technology is so radically different than other technologies that even if every other technology has a sort of um, ironing out of difference effect, a homogeneous effect, well, the internet doesn't. Uh, and the internet comes to dominate all the other technologies, where in a sense, even though perhaps McDonald's is ironing out cultural differences by getting rid of all the uh, country stores and replacing it with fast food, the internet, uh, so as you get homogeneity on one side, the internet comes along and adds radical difference on the other. And, and, and it would be interesting what Adorno would say if he was alive today. I mean, I guess he would have saw some of the television. And, but the television is so different from the internet because you don't choose what you see. Exactly. exactly. And so I, th I don't think Adorno... Especially was, in Europe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, like, you know, and so, I mean, for Adorno, yeah. everyone was going in the direction of the... He, there were the, the new information technologies that were arising was turning everyone off of books and culture, and it was completely passive. Um, the idea of an information technology like the TV that would be individually customizable, um, I think, uh, was not a category in his thought. And that, uh, and that that changes things. Now, he may just say, okay, well, that just, um, there are some people that use it to be super diverse, but the majority are not. You well, could get into and, all and, that. And, you know, like, like I, th I think it's interesting to also consider how, if you look at the, um, the, the printing press, mm. right, uh, the revolution that it kind of brought about, like, uh, it would be weird if somebody had expected like, oh, because of the printing press, you know, and the financial incentives behind it, uh, we're all going to read the same genre of literature. <laughs> but, but that's kind of a dormant prediction. Oh, yeah, it's like, yeah. we're all going to be reading Absolutely. British period pieces or something. It's like, no, what ended up happening is that, yes, uh, a lot of pre-existing popular material got bigger scale. Right. But actually, a bunch of fringe mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. started getting mass produced and he, and he found a new audience mm -hmm. which inspired the creation of whole new mm -hmm. genres. So, mm -hmm. Genres, the number of genres in literature has only increased over time sure. through people reading more books, right? Sure. In the sure. same way, sure. I think like a lot of people were thinking like music, we're all going to end up listening to Drake or something. It's like, mm -hmm. well, 
In a world where we go from listening to 100 songs a week to 1,000, uh, sure, maybe we listen to Drake 500 times, which is way more than we used to. Right. It was 100, right? Uh, but actually, like in the past majority of time, we're listening to way more genres than we have ever had. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with Spotify uh, is that, yeah, like people thought, oh, well, gosh, Spotify is going to be terrible. Then people are just going to listen to Taylor Swift all day. It's right. like, no, they do listen to Taylor Swift a lot. But most of the time, they listen to genres that they would have yeah, never accessed. Thing. That's yeah. true. And and I think, you know, a concern of a Dorno could be tied to Walter Benjamin, which is the notion that once you get replications of the Mona Lisa and you can see the Mona mm-hmm. Lisa anywhere, it loses its quote-unquote aura. It loses its magic because it's just uh, it's something you can get a, simula, simulica, a simulation of, per se, um, a replica of, and so the original loses its magic. So there's this sense in which there's a disenchantment of the world and aesthetics. There's a, a loss of war. And I think that's there's legitimacy to it. So the, the, the question today, is how can you maintain a sense of the, how can you have increased access increased exposure of everything and yet everything maintain a kind of rootedness a kind of particularity and maintain that and that's a real challenge but what's interesting to that is figuring out how to profit from open access open different things but also maintain radical uh, particularity and aura would be a new kind of thinking. And so that would be something where typical thinking would probably not help us figure out. And that would be another example of oh, where, why? Of well, where neurodiversity... Why art is always being dominated by neurodiversity people, right? That's right. Uh, and, you know, I, I met the CEO of Netflix a couple of years ago. Mm. And one of the things that we talked about, um, uh, I said, like, what was the most surprising thing you see in the Netflix data? And mm. he said, uh, I'm always surprised when I see Germans being in love with Narcos, a TV series, right, about Colombians oh, with yeah, yeah, Brazilian yeah. casts. Interesting. Right? Um, and basically, yeah, because, like, you know, like, the Netflix kind of gets to see this. It's like, yeah. Like, so Narco, if you don't talk about particularity, like, like, I feel like actually, like, the one of the mistakes that Hollywood made for a long time, the Netflix just kind of overcame because they mm. came from, like, such a different paradigm, mm. um, is that Hollywood thought uh, there's too much risk in trying to play out, in trying to take risks with a lot mm. of storytelling. Um, if we have not seen it succeed before, we don't know if the market exists. Right. Uh, assuming things, for example, I think actually one of the biggest myths that Hollywood perpetuated for a long time was things like, well, um, black cinema will not play well globally, mm. right? Mm. Because people don't want to see African-American actors or whatever, mm. right? Uh, they want to see like, you know, Westerns or something right. like that. Because you know? right. they had the data to kind of back that up. Like, um, and then all of a sudden, like Netflix comes out and is like, no, actually, like Koreans mm. love, uh, mm. you know, the... Uh, I think it's called the 13th, the Abra Duvernay documentary. Mm. You know, like, like um, and so I, I think actually what Netflix has been doing, which I think has been super good, is this idea of like, they, instead of trying to be prescriptive and they say like, based on our data, you should be making this. They try to go to, uh, they try to invite all sorts of filmmakers mm. that are otherwise rejected by the Hollywood studio system, which mm. would happen, especially, these days it's yeah. different because yeah, yeah, gets, yeah, yeah. it's like a prime choice. But when they used to not get the top, mm. you know, prospects, right? They would just go like, okay, okay, Come pitch us the wildest idea like you have, right? <laughs> right? And then you would look at the data and see like, actually, this may make sense. Because again, Netflix has this recommendation system that tries to, and I, and I really applaud them for this, they try to prioritize uh, diversity exposure mm. in terms of content mm. um, as opposed to uh, conf- creating confirmatory preferences, mm. you know, things that kind of fit your pre-existing taste. Mm. So Netflix mm. is always looking for what is a genre that people that like the genres that you have been watching but you have never seen you know, what can, mm. we can show you, mm. right? So they would show you, like, uh, you know, if they see that, you know, you like British period pieces mm. and, uh, you know, uh, Spanish soap operas, sure, right? Sure. But they also see the people that like those two things, also like horror movies, and you've never seen a horror movie, right. they would show you a horror movie. Well, and what's so nice of what, about um, what you're describing is it's, it's a kind of way you are suggesting that all of these programs to increase diversity um, are what are, have a very substantive role in overcoming rational impasses in yourself, in systems, uh, where if you don't integrate um, neurodiversity into yourself or your collectives or your groups, that there are problems in game theory that you are going to run into that will give you a suboptimal result because well, you it, don't it, have it, that it, diversity it, of thought. And therefore, what, you know, then what Netflix is doing, all these different things, yeah, is it's, it's, it's not just, it's just not window dressing. I mean, a lot of people view diversity or people who are against it or are skeptical yeah, as yeah. a kind of like, oh, we should do it because we should. Yeah, yeah. But when you start saying, no, you know, it, it's, it's how we overcome rational like impasses. Virtue signaling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly, exactly. And, and I really want to discuss, like, I want to underscore, like, it's not just being stuck in a suboptimal equilibrium, right? Like, I, I sure. feel like when I, when I use that expression, like, it maybe doesn't carry point across. There's something catastrophic about rational impasses. Oh, sure. Like, you know, yeah, like, it can be bad. Like, like, it can be super yeah, yeah, exactly. bad. Like, nuclear weapons is a good example. Like, yeah. The Nash equilibrium in a nuclear right. weapons negotiation is 
nuclear uh, mutual destruction. Yeah, right? the cost for not figuring out a rational impasse can sometimes just be mediocre, but sometimes it can be catastrophic. Which is why I think you know the the business economics parallel is like a society that cannot innovate consistently is mm. doomed to fail eventually, right? 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 Like, and so right. the that's why to me all these things are like super related, and like the fact that. The best way, the best algorithm to basically guarantee consistent innovation over time is a radical inclusion, right? Yeah, of mar- no, it, marginalized. Yes. Uh, ends up being like, and I want to make this clear, you know, like I, I kind of talk about this, like sometimes like it's easy to get, to walk away having this naive view that, oh, now that we know this, let's do this, right? Sure, like sure. I, I, I'm, I'm talking more like, you know, the, one of the things I always bring up is that uh, police departments that are most racially integrated mm. uh, in the U.S. Uh, tend to have the highest number of people that are either being fired or leave the force. Hmm. Because diversity, if not managed properly, tends to breed conflict. Right. It's uh, always, hard. It's, yeah, it's exactly. Right. Like getting extroverts and introverts not right. to think of each other as sociopaths yes. like, is it, its, its own challenge, right? Like, but if you do, your team is unstoppable, right? Well, but that but that's where you see the other interesting component is you are suggesting learning social intelligence is the key to getting neurodiversity, which is the key to overcoming rational impasses, which if not done, could have catastrophic impacts. And I think that's that in and of itself is a big deal because often people think of, you know, you know, here's social intelligence over here, but real intelligence is over here. You know, the social stuff is just what you do to make your boss happy, but it's more like a game, you know, a social game. But what you're saying is that um, learning how to have a social intelligence because there is a inherent limit to rational, individual rational intelligence. Therefore, the individual must learn social intelligence in order to have any shot at the neurodiverse intelligence, which is probably speaking the only way to overcome uh, rational impasses. Yeah. So it all goes together in a sort of um, harmony that I don't think you hear very often and they all sound like unrelated pieces and it's not clear how one leads to the other and you have two so- one's people over here emphasizing social intelligence, people over here emphasizing you know, individual enlightenment and different exactly, things. Exactly. So I think what you're adding, a, um, a kind of way of thinking that links them all together. Because exactly, diversity is hard. Like if it's, if it's meaningful, it's hard. Hard. It's like Bonhoeffer exactly. talking about. That like, would be the, the tell, the, 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 the subtle indicator. Yes. Is that uh, if you're if conflict management is not one of the things you're spending most of your time on on your team, like mm-hmm. you're doing it wrong. Well, like, it's like know. Bonhoeffer talking about like a costly discipleship and cheap discipleship. Always that costly grace, cheap grace, and different things. I always like that because um, there really is a sense in which you could have cheap diversity, costly diversity, cheap virtue, costly virtue, something that demands something of yourself, and and so like. What I like about the neurodiversity is it is hard to um, learn to live with people and to be in community with people that think different from you. But the fact that it's hard means that it's probably valuable. real it, and valuable. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so, with, so with that kind of – but then again, you know, people can ask, well, then why do it? And what you're saying, well, if you don't do it, you know, then we're not going to get through rational impasse. Exactly, exactly. It's kind of interesting because, you know, we have this idea that uh, value goes up as something is limited. Yes, you know, it's yes. like a minority, it's limited. So it's almost like in that it's framework, great, like minority it. spins into like value. Yes. It's like, well, I'm pretty rare. And you're going to, unless so there's a competition for limited resources in tech. And what's interesting is if that limited resource is paramount uh, to be included in your collective intelligence so that you overcome rational impasses, then there is a race in a sense for limited resources that if you do not get, you will struggle to overcome rational impasses. And so it's quite interesting to think of almost, you know, uh, it's kind of like uh, we talk about resource wars or something, you know, yeah, competition yeah. for yeah, resource. Yeah. So in your schema, there's a real sense in which um, minorities are transformed in a sense into a limited resource of which there will be competition for, which then is affirmative because people are competing for me. It's like it's like everyone. You're like the guy everyone wants. The girls want to date, or the girl all the guys want to date. So there's, exactly. so the competition creates an affirmation of the minority, and there's a competition for that minority because they play a necessary role. Uh, for overcoming dilemmas in game theory that we are putting under the branch of the, the umbrella of rational impasses, that if those rational impasses are not overcome, the consequences could be dire. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I find that um, there's something beautiful about that. I mean, uh, there's I, something lovely. I, I'm glad. I, I, I try. That's why I try to talk about it in all sorts of different spaces, right? Because mm. obviously uh, the interdisciplinary nature of kind of like the collective intelligence mm. perspective, right? Like, uh, you know, lends itself to kind of talking about the value of diversity mm. in terms of creativity, in terms mm. of like social progress, in terms of innovation. And yeah, and I like concerned. it too because the word minority, for example, what's another word for, you know, the limited, rare. Yes. Isn't it funny though that by, you know, we say minority and it's kind of like minor, 
like yes. low. It's like yes. words. It has this kind of negative sound to it, minor. But then when you say, oh, it's you know rare. Well, is it, you know, because, because, because like minority is always in in a in a binary context. Of yes, minority that's versus minority, right? and, that, and that's where the Derrida yeah. deconstruction is useful. But yeah. but what's beautiful, what's so lovely is in the schema that you're presenting is that really, really the minority becomes rare, like a diamond, like a exactly. rare resource. Exactly. And I think that can be missing sometimes from the diverse conversation because you're, there's still one in this kind of majority diet, and it's almost like we want to raise the minority up to where they're on the same level of the majority. But what's funny is from a value standpoint is if I take a rare resource and make it abundant, it loses its value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and so there can be a negative consequence well, there. And, and again, also part of what I think is great about the content intelligence is that it's, this process is never over. Right. So it's not as if like, because we, we, we're always, our perception is always narrowed. It's always restricted, right? Mm -hmm. So even our understanding of what dimensions of diversity, like, did people even know what extroversion and introversion was sure. like up until 50 years ago, maybe sure. like, you know, like, and I keep thinking like, because those are the ways in which cognitive diversity manifests itself. It's mm -hmm. rarely as simple as gender or race. Right. It's much more complex. It's like personality, class, like right. all these dimensions right. that we weren't even perceiving for most of human history. Right. But that's another example where the, some of the problem can be is that even the conversation about diversity gets captured delusion by sort of the value ideology well, or the ideology. Because it's, it's rational to say it's easier to measure race, mm -hmm. right, or gender diversity, right, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to come up with different metrics. But the, th the thing is, like, yep. I always think about like, if you're not develop, if you're not discovering new metrics, right, to understand human difference, yep. right, then it's only a matter of time. Yeah, it's only a matter of time before the model presents itself as being complete, when it which must necessarily cut off, you know. And once you cut off, then it's no longer diverse, you well, know. But, and that's why like, I always think of like if because the, the way, one of the best ways to kind of manage like the conflict that comes with diversity is to expand kind of middle out, right? Mm -hmm. like you you ask everybody in the company to hire who's somebody that is very different from you, but you can get along with, mm -hmm. right? Like. Mm -hmm. That radically increases the diversity of your organization way faster mm. than any recruitment, you know, mm. quota based system, mm. right? Mm. But then I'm always fascinated, like, once you include a trans woman of color, for example, in your tech company, and you ask her, bring somebody that, you know, you, mm. you, 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 you think is marginalized that most people forget about, like mm. somebody that people mm. struggle to working with, but mm. you, you have a great relationship with, mm -hmm. who do they bring? Like, if you yeah. ask a trans woman of color, like, who do you think we should bring, like, you know, besides other trans women of color, oh, yeah. like, that... And you keep kind of expanding, and um, I'm a big believer that it takes just as much effort to go for the much harder case, mm -hmm. right, of inclusion, uh, than to go for m what appears to be kind of similar cases of like just smaller, like you know, dimensions of diversity. And uh, it, it, and again, it, it, it easily, and I've noticed this like talking to my trans friends, like you move entirely away almost for, like from like these usual metrics we're thinking about in terms of like, gender mm -hmm. and race, mm -hmm. and you start thinking about. Like, like, like when I ask the question to my tra my transfer example, a lot of times, like they most of the, the conversation is about uh, uh, people with autism, mm. which is fascinating. I'm like, wow! Like, if you like, like I've, I've had all these conversations, and like, it's always some variant of like, yeah, like I would bring somebody with autism because mm. they're very different, you know, like, mm. and yet our struggle mm. is somewhat, you know, similar mm. in all these different ways because we're both neurodivergent, right? Mm. Like, uh, and then once you, and if I, I if I ask my friends, like, you know, on the autism spectrum, I'm like, who would you rather bring? And like. Uh, I, I, one of the answers I hear a lot actually is uh, um, people that we usually consider disabled, like you know, visually mm, impaired visual. or whatever. Mm. Uh, and like I've met visually impaired programmers, mm. fascinating. They're able oh, to yeah. you, the way they, they code is that they have this program that goes to the web page and just reads the raw code really? of the page, and they're listening to it like at five hundred words per minute. What? And then they pause it because they can't move the mouse, right? Sure. So the mouse just keeps going, you know, like in these like horizontal yeah. lines, like, and they're like listening to it, and they're like, okay, okay, ah, I'm here where I need to be, and then, well, voice interfaces have like changed the game, obviously. That's unbelievable. Well, it, it's fascinating because I'm like, they're faster than me at writing code, and they're like, they can't, they can't use the, the mouse. Can't use the mouse. <laughs> it's, just, it's amazing. That's it's, crazy. It's like, and um, and, and you know, in the process, like I've, I've uh, uh, you know, I met these guys a few years ago that built this app actually initially for visually impaired programmers. They end up becoming an amazing coding app for like regular programmers. Wow, isn't that amazing? Well, like, well, what's, well what's so and you know because they had all these keyboard shortcuts. That's why. Oh, they yeah. had all these that's keyboard so, shortcuts. That's, so <laughs> that's nuts. I don't know how that works. That's crazy. <laughs> well, what's also interesting is that if we take seriously the idea that I need neurodiversity um, and, and different ways of thinking in general, I, I assume would fit into this. 
uh, in order to create um, the efficiency of a collective intelligence that if I do not have, I will not overcome a rational impasse. Well, then actually anyone who's different from me becomes a kind of limited resource exactly. that I need. And right now we have conservatives hate liberals. We have liberals hate conservatives. Exactly. We have blue collar hates white. There's so much because, and I think all this hatred and partisanship or because, you know, the funny thing is if you ask people, do you, you know, if you ask a liberal, do you hate conservatives? They'll say, no, I don't. And if you ask conservatives, they just happen to never speak with them. They just exactly. happen to never well, be around. That's why if you ask them, would you hire one? Yeah, that's right. And then that's right. It's costly. You know, we were talking about cheap. You know, it is uh, it is not cheap diversity for a liberal to, say, hire a Trump supporter or vice versa. That's quite, quite um, costly. That has an emotional burden on them. So there's a good chance that it's real. <laughs> um, and you see, what I really like about this this thinking is that uh, I, I, when I'm confronted with real difference, that's going to cost me if I'm uh, the Trump supporter um, hi considering hiring a liberal. But I know that if I don't, I'm at risk of not overcoming a rational impasse. Well, then I am for, I have to ask myself a question. I'm like, well, am I going to let my um, uncomfortableness, my bigotry maybe, my, my hatred, uh, am I so married to that that I'm, will I'm not going to overcome that and just accept the possible calamities of rational impasses, or am I going to get better? Am I going to learn with people different yeah, I, from I guess it's from like, me? like the first step in this whole process most of the time mm. is usually like, because I've seen people try to sell diversity in grounds of like innovation, mm. right? You know, mm. uh, having more women in your company mm. it makes it easier to come up with products that appeal to women. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I tend to go for the, more the catastrophic analysis of like, no, like it's not, like it's good for innovation. It's like if you don't do this, mm. you're doomed. That's what game oh, theory. Oh, starting oh, from sure, the game sure, theory, sure, sure, I sure. think is like super important. And I, I also want to bring this up because I think you find this very interesting. Like, um, I, I, I've been learning about some of the um, early theorems von Neumann, who's, who's oh, yeah. one, of the, one of the smartest oh, yeah, people yeah, of all yeah, time, yeah. right? Like, uh, who was one of the fathers of game theory. One of his side projects was starting game theory, basically, <laughs> which is amazing. Like, you know, so so I've been reading like his book with. Um, Morganston. And so mm. one, one of the theorems is called the von neumann morganston theorem mm. in game theory. And it's pretty simple. Basically, it says that uh, the way you turn a zero-sum game between n number of players mm. into a positive-sum game is by removing one of the players and distributing the payoff that would have gone to that player to everybody else. Oh, yeah? Ah. What does that sound like? Mm. scapegoating yeah right yeah like this notion yeah, of like yeah, how do you yeah, resolve yeah, a zero-sum yeah, situation yeah. right Gerard. removing exactly yeah. exactly in in, in in like what what's really interesting and this is why i'm going to this because like this opens up a whole new thread here like um what this is saying what one of the aspects i really emphasize about game theory is that like uh, this is how ais operate ais are fully rational so mm. all these conversations we're having with humans at least we are just crazy enough not to nuke each other even yeah. though that's a game theoretical thing to do yeah, yeah. right um but an AI oh, is purely that. operating game theory. So if what mm. what the theorem proves, right, is that even though AIs have no concept of ritualization, yeah, whatever, yeah. All, none, none of these things, right, you know, they, we associate, we associate scapegoating with human nature. Like, no, like from a game theory perspective, they'll start scapegoating each other. So it's mm. so deep. It's so deep. I and see. like, you can't be passive. That's one of the things about game theory is like, you I can't see. just be passive. You know, these problems don't go away, right? If you don't think about them. Like so if we don't learn to be, well, one, if we're not neurodiverse, we're certainly not going to integrate AI into it. We're either going to let AI do it's, it all by it, itself. Exactly, exactly. It's supposed to integrate AI integrating into it all. And if we don't do that, then AI may attempt to be autonomously rational per se in nuke us all, uh, because it will arrive at a rational impasse and say, well, now nah, we'll just nuke everyone. Well, in, in the best way to prevent the AI from hyper-optimizing the removal of players from mm. the game to, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. is to teach it to go in the opposite direction which is like if you make the easiest target safe yes then everybody feels safe so all of a sudden you have to figure out a positive sum framework mm. uh through a different lens mm. and, and i guess that's, that's why i bring this up it's like this notion of like yeah like you know in the process we can only teach ai not to solve zero-sum struggles right by removing Players by making right? it neurally diverse. Exactly, <laughs> you know, because it has to, you know, because because one of the, you know, there's one of stuff is also pretty obvious. It's important, like mm. you know, Gerard and scapegoating. Right. It's always about like uh, you can the scapegoating mechanism to resolve social conflict only works 
if you're able, if there's somebody that is marginalized, like that's excluded, right. that everybody feels different from, right, right, uh, so they can label them an outsider, and then they can be, you know, mm. murder weapon. Yeah, right, right, right. So whether it's like an old lady, you know, being a, being a witch, or an orphan, uh, you know, not having ties to the community, all like if you think of like the victims of ritualized violence across sure. human history, they tend to be pretty marginalized people, they're mentally yeah. ill, all, yes. all these people, right, yes. you know, uh, and so. It's almost like, yeah, like another great algorithm to figure out who is the person they should be radically including is who is most likely to get be picked. A scapegoat. Exactly. <laughs> to be scapegoated. You know? That's quite interesting. So so if we don't do neurodiversity, there's going to be a scapegoat mechanism and at some point you take that far enough along and the AI nukes us all because it's exactly. gonna make a scapegoat. Exactly. Yes. yes. We have to overcome this, right, through just moving in the opposite direction. Which is like, you know, the Gerardian is like the sole notion of like if you end the scapegoating mechanism that's how you get people to st- like he has the whole line like we didn't stop burning witches because we discovered science we discovered science because we, we stopped, stopped burning, burning witches, witches right? right because yeah because if you, if you can blame if you can solve the social conflict brought about by disease the chaos of disease mm-hmm. by blaming a lady you know in, in right you know burning her then you right? never have incentive to solve the problem exactly you never discover science right. you never cure disease right, right. Like, you know right. and so um, ai is i think is just as likely to do this Mm. Uh, I think that so the, so when you give it to the scapegoat mechanism, you're forced to solve your problems. Exactly, well, especially because like in a world where you have several AIs, mm. who is most likely to be scapegoated? You know, a human. Yeah. Because the human would be the outsider. Right. They would be the right. inferior cognitive entity from so, the so perspective, if, right? So if, so if we don't learn to overcome the scape mechanism, of which neurodiversity is key for that, which entails us learning, uh, which requires us to learn social intelligence and overcome all the difficulty of diversity, and actually, if we don't do that, we certainly as heck aren't going to program AI that overcomes exactly. the scapegoat. Exactly. Because, especially scapegoat. because the AI, as the ultimate embodiment of rationality, will yeah. identify human human existence is irrational. I see. So right? another way to put it, because I guess is like, so what AI will do is, I, you know, to bring back that Three Stooges image, it, you know, where the rational impasse is where everyone gets stuck in the door at the same time. The AI will say, well, I'll just kill the people next to me and then I'll be able exactly. to get through. Exactly. 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 Uh, <laughs> but that's not an option. And like, you know, so we well, cannot... Because normally the cycle ends up being like, if it's Three Stooges, right? Uh, the door can fit two of them. So yeah, they kill yeah. the yeah. weaker one yeah. and then they get into another door that only fits one of them and they, you know, That's in, in this endless cycle, right? Like, and But but if you integrated neurodiversity, the idea would dawn on, on in you to let one person go one at a time. Exactly, exactly, yes. exactly, exactly. Like, you yeah. know, and, and uh, you know, still keeping in the theme of like human AI partnership, like that's one thing I've been really disappointed in, uh, in the AI community. Mm. Uh, we don't do enough studies showing what happens if humans and AIs get to work together. Hmm. You, usually, most of the research is I. It, 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 it's some a partnership very, is more optimal. Is it, it, exactly. Yes. Yeah, but but most of the time, like the studies you see are things like uh, an AI beats a doctor at diagnosing disease. Rarely do they show you what happens if the doctor and the AI work together, ah. right? And performance normally goes up. There are a lot of right. Uh, yeah. The, the example I think about is like they in the in the Philadelphia Philadelphia General Hospital. Uh, they they came up with this. Uh, machinery model that basically was using the electronic healthcare records hmm. to diagnose uh, like the really life-threatening childhood p- p- pneumonia cases because yeah. it's complex because children are very complex you hmm. know, as a system, right? Um, and uh, DI's accuracy level uh, was like 89% uh, compared to the average pediatrician, right? Uh, which is 75%. Hmm. And usually that's the end of the conversation. Hmm. Usually that's the end of the conversation. It's like, right. well, you know, in a meritocratic system, the AI would just replace all the doctors. Right. They then, but they actually ended up doing the experiment. Like, what if we tell the AI? I want to get. I want to get into some of the deals because I think this is important. Like, because sure. it's not quite as like you just get them to work together. Like, sure. Okay. They told the AI. They programmed the AI to do this thing first. They they penalized the AI for failing to identify a life threatening case way more than they penalized it for identifying a case as life threatening that was not life threatening. Huh. Okay. This is the first step. Then they told the doctors, use your, don't think about it from the traditional symptom analysis. Use your, it's, you know, because a lot of pediatrician, like, you know, they, they have these ways of like teaching the child's body, right? To identify, mm. you know, like, uh, use your special touch or whatever, right? Um, um, to figure out if the AI flagged the child as life threatening when they're not life threatening. Mm. Uh, accuracy went up to 98%. Really? So, so okay, so, so you see what I'm saying? Like, it's like, the reason why I want to get into the details is like, this is very important. Like, yeah, the yeah, AI yeah, yeah. does not differentiate on the impact of a mistake, you know, of yeah. failing to find something or finding something that was not there, right? Um, so that's the first step. Uh, secondly, the comparative advantage of human perception, because the AI can't touch. What, 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 
what are the ways to physical touch? Right, you, sure. Like, like that, 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 it's so hard to encode, right? Like, so the like the comparative advantage of the AI's hyper rational, unbiased, uh, just pure sure. data pattern matching, uh, alongside the doctor's almost purely intuitive, hmm. right? Framework hmm. together uh, achieved ways in which like. If you had asked either participant, they thought it would never be possible. Well, this is really interesting because um, it almost sounds as if you were suggesting. So right now, there's a dream of general uh, intelligence mm -hmm. where we can get when will AI become general intelligence, and a lot of people are like, eh, a long time from now. Um, but it's almost as if, in some respects, when you get a human AI partnership under the right conditions, I'm not saying it's the same as general intelligence, but it's almost in the space between them, you get something that's more approaching that. And yet, it's almost like because we have a such such a bias, maybe where we just want AI to do all of it, we're not even exploring that possibility. Uh, yeah. well, that, it, it to bring it full circle, like that's why my research started, because uh, when I started grad school uh, in 2016, mm. it was the peak of deep mind beating the world champion mm. of right? And the conversation was Daniel Kahneman had won a Nobel Prize yeah, a yeah, few yeah, years yeah, prior, yeah. right? So it was like, yeah, and Daniel Kahneman is one of the people that advocates the most of algorithms replacing clinicians, mm. because under his model of the flawed perception, you know, the cognitive yeah, yeah, bias yeah. human mind, right? A, an algorithm. Is way better because the algorithm sure. does not the, the algorithm outperforms the human inherently because mm -hmm. the algorithm does not have the biases the human has. Right, right. Um, and I find that that is one of the and I think we're we're about to achieve a paradigm shift. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping in the next few years, like because we're not we because we, we didn't even ask the question for too long about what happens if humans and AIs work together. Mm -hmm. All of the, the few resources that exist, they all point to the same conclusion: performance goes up. Right, because again, it's a compatibility. Mm. So let me bring up another anecdote that I think is also super important. So Gary Kasparov, when he lost oh, yeah, to Deep Blue, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So the, the World Chess Champion, when he lost to Deep Blue, he ran this um, open chess tournament where basically grandmasters, right? Yeah, yeah. In, mm -hmm. in uh, chess engines were competing. Mm. The winner of the tournament were oh, I forgot, oh, gosh, I always forget this. I think it was like three mediocre chess players and two like mediocre chess engines, and they beat like grandmasters. Really? Ma major chess engines and grandmasters working with major chess engines. Wow. And the theory is that the problem is that the, when the grandmaster and the chess engine work together, they have a hard time because the grandmaster doesn't trust the chess engine and the chess engine doesn't trust. Is that, is oh, it, yeah, exactly I think like, I read that. Yeah, okay, yeah, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas the, the humility, the humble, humble mediocre yes. chess player, player. Yes. Exactly. Uh, and the lower level of complexity of the chess engine enables a high level of compatibility and they get to upper so like it's almost like a money ball type of effect interesting right where yeah, yeah, a yeah, team yeah. that works well together outperforms a team of pure performers that don't work well together interesting right and um hmm. I, I i you know but that I, gets into getting the end the socialization element or the social relations of the individual actors and therefore the collective engine uh, the collective is optimized by that social intelligence or learning to work with those different like we were saying with the organization you know, that that would be a potential component that would be very necessary, where precisely because someone is an expert, they're like, yeah, I don't need you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, like, you know, and as opposed to, you know, doubling down on hyper-specialization to develop expertise, higher mm. levels of expertise, mm. uh, which, you know, it makes sense because we're used to thinking about sports. Sports is about people obsessively improving 1% every day, right? right? You know? sure, sure, uh, sure. But maybe that's not the solution. It's, it's like, you know, as opposed to, you got to find people that are very compatible in terms of they work together, you know, better. Like, AI, human AI configurations that work well together. Like, I I even think, gosh, we could get into so many, because obviously my sure, research sure. is this intersection of, like, machine learning and cognitive science. Mm. But, like, I, I'll just narrow it down to this. Like, I think what we're seeing with the human AI partnership studies mm. uh, is what I think is indicative of, like, what neurodivergence collaboration mm. kind of look like, which is, like, yeah. It seems rational to say, I my programming level is eighty five, right? Mm. Uh, the neurodivergent person's programming mm. level is seventy five. Mm. Mm. Uh, they're going to slow me down, right? As opposed to thinking, if the AI thought that way, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. Um, And yet, actually, maybe working with the neurodivergent programmer, who, even though they score lower on a programming test, right? Yeah, that's you interesting because there is a sense in which the doctor is slower than the computer, and yet there's something <laughs> in that slowness. That may be um, advantageous to fascinating well, it, thinking fast it, and it, slow. It, right? it, it, I think it goes back to the like, basic principle of economics of comparative advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, the, yeah. this this idea that like you know, it, it, and I, I love to explain this to the debate kids. It's like comparative advantage does not say the two equally um, prosperous countries uh, can work together by specializing. The comparative, a comparative advantage is even weirder. It's saying that even a country that's better at producing two different goods, you know, <laughs> right. is better off 
working with another guy to specialize it in other mm. guys because of opportunity cost. Yeah. Because yep. of opportunity cost. It's like, and because again, I think a lot of people in economics like walk away thinking like, oh, it's just like, you know, too highly competent people yeah, work yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah. No, no, even, even if the AI is objectively better than the doctor, creating a comparative advantage dynamic, mm. you know, with the doctor, mm. uh, uh, ends up outperforming the AI alone because the AI gets to focus on what it does way right, better. what it does way better. Well, in that break, so, so one, we need to emphasize neurodiversity, yes. <laughs> of which in order to do well, it has to cost us, and that means we have to pay the price of learning social intelligence, of which may actually mean that the answer is not we all become experts, but learn how to meet each other in the right space so we can mo um, optimize the collective intelligence. Which the, the, the diverse collective intelligence uh, is the only way uh, to overcome rational impasses. Which if we do not learn how to overcome rational impasses, then as AI comes along, it will only be a matter of time before AI cannot over... We don't integrate with the AI in a neurodiverse way and thus the rational impasses lead to catastrophic um, catastrophe. And so... What we must do is take these um, neurally diverse uh, social intelligence uh, advice that you are putting forth so that we will be ready for evolutions in AI technology so that we can uh, diversify ourselves with that AI to give rise to something that perhaps is more so approaching a general intelligence mm -hmm. so that we may overcome rational impasses, Nash equilibrium to rational impasses, which if we do not, the cost will be quite dire, but if we do, exactly. the product will be beautiful. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's, it's this weird context where like avoiding catastrophe. Mm. Uh, it's not just about avoiding. Catastrophe. It's like it, you're able to tap into like a higher plane of innovation, so, creativity, you know, success. So, uh, so if so, if we avoid the apocalypse, the lamb may lie down with yeah. the lion. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, uh, well, Lorenzo, this has been a delight. I certainly appreciate your time. Thank you for coming today. Thank and uh, I look forward to your work and thank you for everything you're doing. It's really been a delight.